Hello everyone and welcome to another edition of What's On My Desk. And this time again, what's not going to be my desk, it's gonna be my buddy Adam's desk. I'm doing another collab with a buddy of mine named Adam Golden of Mental Watches. So Adam Golden of Mental Watches, as I dubbed him, the golden boy of vintage stuff. I have always known about him. I've seen him at the shows here and there. Never really did anything together. Never really met the kid until uh, the last Miami Antique show that we did where I was on a hunt for a Blanc Pond Aqualong. A vintage Blanc Pond Aqualong, not the modern one, which is the watch I'm actually wearing today that I ended up picking up from Adam for my personal collection. Again, I told you guys before, I don't collect a lot of watches, but there's just a few pieces that I feel are iconic enough that should be a part of my collection, both modern and vintage. And the Blanc Pong Aqualong is a very, very iconic watch. A uh, little bit about Adam. Adam is actually an attorney. That's right, he is a lawyer. When he graduated college, his father gave him a Jaeger Reverso as a college graduating gift. And guess what? He caught the watch bug right there and then. All right, there goes that bug. And uh, he started talking watches, trading watches, buying, selling watches, talking to like-minded individuals about watches. And lo and behold, before he knew it, he got into it a lot deeper than he thought. And he quit. He quit his legal career. And he started selling watches as a career and never, ever looked back. His specialty is vintage pieces. Blanc Ponds is one of his specialties, vintage Blanc Ponds, vintage Omegas, among many other things. You can check out his Instagram. He's got a bunch of cool shots of a bunch of cool vintage watches. Every time he posts something, I want to buy it. And you can also check out his website. I'll link everything below. So I called Adam and I'm like, Adam, we got to do a collab. I need you to, to give a perspective on vintage pieces. I've done an episode with Bob Marin about a lot of vintage stuff, but most of the stuff is Paddock and Rolex, where this guy tends to go a bit of a different route. And another reason is a selfish reason. I mentioned to you guys in previous episodes how I'm looking to pick up a brigade and I'm sort of in between either picking up the original military brigade uh, that doesn't have the brigade writing, the one that's from 1952, versus the one that was made later with the writing brigade on it that was no longer made for the military but made as part of the regular lineup for brigade. And guess what? Adam is the guy that is showing me both of those watches, so I'm hoping maybe he can do this on camera, show it to you guys, show it to me, hopefully help me make a decision. So Adam, first question to you, how the hell do you go from being a lawyer to becoming a full-time watch dealer? Like, like, what did your parents have to say about that? I'm just curious. Hey Roman, uh, thanks for having me on the show. Really appreciate it. Little known fact that you probably don't know, I'm not sure if I ever told you, uh, but back in the day when I actually was still just a collector, not a dealer, I used to peruse your site pretty much daily, daydreaming about that next watch and you know what I can save up to, to buy. And uh, you guys have a fantastic site. Uh, excited to do this with you. Uh, as to your question about my parents, I, I got really lucky. My parents are very supportive. Uh, I actually was practicing uh, law with my dad at the time, so I think he was a little disappointed that I was leaving, you know, the family practice to do watches full time, which I guess he didn't really understand. But he was very supportive. He knew that this was my passion and you know my life's work, so he uh, gave me the go ahead, so to speak. Honestly. A truly cool story. I thought my story was cool how I got into watches, but I think yours kind of beats mine if you ask me. My next question to you is obviously I want you to show myself and my audience some watches and I would like for you to start, if you don't mind, to talk a little bit about the watch that I bought from you. I know you probably have similar pieces in stock right now. Tell me the significance of Aqualong, the retailer that retail these Blanc Pong watches. Tell me about the different variations because I know they vary from $20,000 all the way up to $70,000. If you can tell me about that and maybe show me a piece or two you have in stock, that would be great. Yeah, so I'm glad you asked about Blanc Pond. Um, I think we talked about it in person. You know, these are my favorite vintage dive watches. Yes, more than a Submariner, and I know that is blasphemy for a lot of people, but it's true. Uh, for me, uh, they just ooze cool. They are a quintessential dive watch, and there's a debate that's raged on, which I believe I'm on the side of Blanc Pond, that they were the actual first uh, dive watch with a rotating bezel before the Submariner. They came out right around the same time in 53, 54, uh, but I believe Blanc Pond beat Submariner to it. They're really, really special watches. Uh, history behind them is that there were two frogmen, which were French military divers who were trying to build a proper dive watch because they were frustrated with the ones that they were using at the time. 
Uh, they designed a watch, they took it to a couple different uh, distributors and makers. The first one that they approached actually was the French brand Lip, who was actually a bigger brand than Blancpain at the time. Lip said no, they didn't want to do it, took it to Blancpain, who agreed to commission the watch, strangely enough. And several years down the road, Lip actually realized they made a mistake and they approached Blancpain and they did a collaboration. That's why you'll see some 50 Fathoms co-signed Lip and they were retailed by the brand Lip. To answer the second part of your question uh, regarding the watch I sold to you, a beautiful Blancpain Aqualung, uh, Aqualung was pretty much just a retailer of dive equipment. So they sold scuba gear, you know, snorkels, all that kind of stuff. And they also sold dive watches. So they put their name on the Blancpain 50 Fathoms so that was easily distinguishable when somebody went to buy it in their store as being their watch. Um, kind of in similar fashion to what you see on some Rolex that are signed Tiffany & Co. or Cartier, just a specific store selling a specific model of their watch. Um, I do have a few Blancpain in stock I will share with you today, uh, some really special and cool watches. The first one I'm going to show to you today is the earliest watch that I have here, which is a what we call an RI. They call it that because it is, says Rotomatic Inca Block on the bottom, and it's the easiest way to separate this model from another model, so the collectors call it the RI model. Uh, this one was born, you know, right in the early 50s to mid 50s, probably 54, 55. By the way, this example happens to be one of the nicest examples I've ever seen in the world. And I'm not just saying that because it's my watch. It truly is. You can see it on my website. It, the condition is fantastic. It, it was probably never used as an actual dive watch because it's so well preserved. Um, so this one has an early, you know, gilt, glossy radium dial. Uh, the radium is extremely well preserved, nice orange color, the bezel has basically no cracks, and the case, you know, no scratches, no marks, no polishing. Um, just a really fantastic early example, probably one of the more common models, certainly more common than your Aqualung, uh, but the condition on this watch just speaks volumes. But the second watch that I want to show to you today, and Roman, you briefly talked about the upper echelon of those prices that they can range from twenty to seventy thousand dollars. We're talking about the upper echelon now. It's a military ball upon fifty fathoms. So, uh, certain militaries, such as the French, American governments, would commission Blanc Pawn to create their dive watches for them because they were so popular and, and well received. Uh, this happens to be one of those watches. The model number is called the Milspec 1, Milspec meaning military specification. This one also happens to be in excellent condition, although it is not for sale, unfortunately. Sorry, everybody. It's in the hands of a private collection. Um, he allowed me to film it to show everybody. Uh, condition, you know, as you see in the video, uh, is also very, very excellent. And the cool thing about this one too, for all you vintage nerds out there, it has a nice brown tropical dial. So what that means is that due to the natural aging of the watch and the paint that was actually used or the lacquer that was used on the dial, it naturally aged from black to brown without any humidity or moisture. A lot of people think, and by the way, uh, this is a nice tip for everybody, a lot of people think that any dial that turns brown is tropical. It's not true. True tropical dials are dials that naturally age from black to brown without any physical elements, you know, interacting with it, such as, you know, moisture, water, etc. It's just a natural progression from black to brown. Um, this one has a gorgeous brown dial, and it's the only mill spec I've ever seen that has a true natural tropical dial. The third watch I want to share with everybody today is for sale. It is a very interesting and very rare watch, probably one of the rarest uh, Blanc Ponds that you can find. There's only a handful, maybe five, six, seven examples that have ever come to market. It is a Blanc Pond 50 Fathoms, but if you look closer, it doesn't say Blanc Pond on the dial, it says Waltham. Uh, Waltham was an American watchmaking company, and they loved the 50 Fathoms model so much that they commissioned their own watches to brand under their own brand Waltham. They, again, are extremely rare, very few have survived over the years and maybe one or two comes to market every year or so. So yeah, it's a really interesting piece, again, also from the 1950s, uh, and something that you just don't really see very often. It's uh, a true novelty. Adam, after hearing that, I'm very glad that I bought this watch from you in Miami. It's like any other watch lover, not a watch dealer, when you hear someone else talk about how special these pieces are, it makes you feel even that much more special, so thank you for this. But I do wanna to talk to you about something else that I've been kind of playing around with, that is Omega, specifically the Speedmaster. I've done numerous episodes on the history of Speedmasters, as well as more of their modern stuff rather than vintage. I know that you're the guy that can pull out something extremely special for Omega, something old, something with a lot of history. So, 
Show me a special Omega. Tell my viewers all about it. What makes it special? What makes it collectible? Because Omega collectability is right up there next to Rolex, I believe, specifically the Speedmaster line. Anything that has to do with space, in my eyes, is super attractive as a collector, again, rather than as a watch dealer. So, Adam, passing the ball over to you. Talk to me about Omegas. Yeah, I'm really glad you asked that. I'm glad we're talking about them because Speedmasters have soared in popularity in the past five or so years and rightfully so. I think they're really finally getting the recognition they deserve because they truly are historical and important watches. Um, as everybody probably knows, I'm sure you've touched upon in your earlier videos, as you said, uh, the history of the Speedmaster is legendary. Uh, it was chosen by NASA to be the moon watch and the watch used by astronauts in space in the early 60s. So they started testing a few different models. Um, they tested the Rolex Cosmograph, reference 6238. They tested the Wittenauer Professional chronogra uh, Chronograph, which was a reference 235, uh, not the 242 as a lot of people think. And they tested the Speedmaster. They ultimately chose the Speedmaster uh, because the caliber 321 movement versus the Valjeu 72, which was used in the other watches, was better suited for, I guess, space. <laughs> um, so they chose the Speedmaster. The first Speedmaster used in space, I believe, was in 64 by Ed White. And we have one of his watches here, or the model that he used here today that I'm going to be showing you. And then ultimately in 1969, the Speedmaster was used on the moon landing. Uh, which is where it gets its fame from now. So I have a few models I want to show you here today. The first two are produced in the same year, yet are drastically different. The first one I'm showing you is the Ed White model I was speaking of earlier. It was used by astronaut Ed White. It is the earlier case style of the Speedmaster, so what that means is that it has a smaller profile, 38 millimeter profile, and it has what we call straight lugs. So if you look at the two watches, the big difference uh, was basically an upgrade uh, for Omega. They made the straight lug to the twisted lug case, which was a much more robust, bigger, sturdier case. And they included crown guard protection so that the crown and pushers were not damaged while engaged in any activity. Uh, such as space travel. They haven't really changed this design much in the past, well, pretty much up until present day. I get often uh, asked by collectors and new new buyers and people entering the vintage market, what's the perfect starter vintage watch? And for the past, I'd say three years, my answer has been absolutely the same regardless of who asks me. It's a vintage Speedmaster, but it's not just any Speedmaster. I would never recommend somebody just to dump in buying one of the early reference 2915 or 2998s because those are, number one, a lot of a lot of money, and B, probably more for the season collector. Uh, what I always recommend somebody purchase as their first vintage watch is this watch right here. It is a 1990s or, you know, circa 80s, circa 90s, even 70s, reference 1450. 22 Speedmaster. It is basically the same watch, used the same caliber 861, which Omega transitioned to into 1969. It's basically the same exact watch that was used on the moon landing. There's really aesthetically not much different. And if you get one of these 70s, 80s, 90s uh, Speedmasters with a tritium dial, they develop this beautiful patina most of the time. Whereas when they transition in the 2000s to the Luminova dials, they don't age as gracefully, we should say, in terms of that nice vintage cool patina look. Um, so yeah, these are still relatively affordable. You could get an entry level Speedmaster like the one I'm holding right now for around three, 4,000 bucks. I think it's a great first edition and a great way for any new collector to get their feet wet with vintage watches. And also it's a really sturdy and practical watch to wear for daily use. And the last watch I want to share with everybody today, maybe some of you noticed it on my wrist. Um, it's not for sale. It's a really special watch and I'm really excited to own it for now. Um, it is the very first reference Speedmaster, the reference 2915-1, um, which was produced around 1957, 1958. Uh, the first reference 2915 was made in three different variations, dash one, dash two, dash three, obviously the dash one being the earliest. The dash one and the dash two were the only Speedmasters that Omega produced using an actual steel bezel before they transitioned to an acrylic bezel. They used broad arrow hands, as you can see in the video. It's a really special watch. There are very few survivors of these watches out there. When they come to market or they hit the auction floor, people go nuts. And what's special about this one, like the Blanc Pond I mentioned earlier, is just truly the condition on it is spectacular. Still has all of its original loom, 
Uh, it's aged to a nice, beautiful patina color. And again, like the mil spec we discussed before, it has a beautiful brown tropical dial. It is aged naturally from its original black to like a nice caramel brown color. Uh, it has its original bracelet. It's just a spectacular watch. I'm excited to be able to share it with everybody. Well, see, now you mess me up completely. Instead of thinking about the brigades that I want to buy, now I'm thinking about an Omega Speedmaster Vintage that I would like to buy. But uh, nevertheless, thanks for that. That was awesome. Let's talk about the brigades that I've been discussing over the last few episodes on my channel, and that is the Type 20. You guys know the history behind it. I'm sure Adam will mention that as well. And really the dilemma I have is choosing between the original military spec Type 20 that was spec'd out for the French military in 1952 that does not have the brigade writing on it, versus the later model that already has the brigade writing on it and that was made as part of their regular sports line. So Adam, if you can shed a little bit more light into the history of the Type 20, what makes the watch so special? And in your opinion, which do you think I should actually choose? I would really appreciate that. Passing the baton once again to Adam. The Brigade Type 20s, really, really cool watches. I understand why you're into them, Roman. Um, short answer to your question, the difference between civilian and military is really not that much. Uh, they produced the civilian and military models around the exact same time, starting in the 1950s. Uh, I guess what you really could say is that certain military issued watches were made to military spec uh, different than the civilian. All the Type 20s are technically military spec watches, uh, but certain military might have wanted something specific for them uh, that they would order Brigade to do. The coolest thing about the military watches for me, obviously, and what I personally you know, gravitate towards is the provenance. Uh, you know that these watches were actually used during service, uh, whether it was on a pilot's wrist or not. They are kind of a part of history as opposed to just being sold to somebody in a store. Really what's indicative of that is if you flip this watch over, you see all these weird engravings on the back and they say FG and then there's some numbers scribbled there. Well, what FG stands for is fin de guarantee. My French isn't great, but I think it roughly translates to the end of guarantee, the end of the warranty. So what they would do is every time this watch was issued to a pilot, a uh, watchmaker would stamp it FG and a date, and the pilot would know that by that date, that's when the warranty on the military specifications of the watch would end, and they would need to take it back in so it would get recertified. Um, so it's really cool. I mean, you can see on this example, there are several of them. So this watch, you know, if it could tell stories, the stories it would tell probably was on the wrist of many pilots or many flights and saw a lot of action. It's also in really great condition, really nice watch, great case, you know, not a lot of marks on it, um, and the dial has no damage, although I'm sure it was replaced during service, which was normal for these watches at the time. Military watchmakers really wanted to make sure that their pilots had the very best in, in proper working order at all times, so they would replace parts as needed. So yeah, I, 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 there is not much difference between the military and civilian specification watches. It's really just a preferential thing. Uh, most of the military ones do not say Breguet on the dial, uh, but some do, some CEV issued watches do say Breguet on the dial. So it's really just to what you gravitate towards and uh, like any watch, you should be buying what you like first and foremost. Okay, as if that was not confusing enough, yeah, I'm still having a tough time deciding. But, Ian, drum roll please. Adam, I'm going to go with the military spec. I think that's really the watch that sits for me. And the reason for that, again, maybe the fact that I'm ex-military, maybe the fact that it's the true first brigade type 20, even though it doesn't really even say brigade on it. I'm a big fan of military pieces. I'm a big fan of brigade. In my opinion, is the godfather of all watchmaking. And I think owning the very, very first time piece is certainly a better bet for me because I'm not the one that often cares about people seeing that it's actually a brigade on my hands. I think for those that know, will know. And I think that's the piece I'm gonna buy. So surprise, surprise, Adam, ship me the military one. I will take that watch and I will enjoy it for years to come. So in closing, lots of interesting stories out there of how people get into the watch business to begin with. Lots of different opinions, a lot of different things and a lot of different experts. There's the older experts like Bob Marin and there's the young blood or the golden boys like Adam Golden. For me, I never claim to know everything. I never claim to be the foremost expert on anything. I do know enough about history of watchmaking. I do have a decent knowledge when it comes to vintage stuff, but when it comes to 
purchasing something for myself or even for one of my clients when they ask me for advice, I always reach out to guys like Adam to ask for their advice, to ask for their opinion on a particular watch because not every vintage watch out there is all that great in terms of condition, original parts, and so on and so forth. So now that I got my Breguet and I let the cat out of the bag, now you know which Breguet I bought. I will definitely show you that watch on one of the episodes of What's On My Desk once Adam actually ships me the watch. Uh, but for now, I hope you guys enjoyed that another collab. I'm going to continue doing this with those that I feel I should. Try to find guys out there that can provide the type of content that I feel might be interesting for you, my audience. I want to thank Adam once again for doing this with me. We'll certainly do this again, hopefully next time in person rather than remote. Adam is in Florida. I'm in Philadelphia. Roman, thank you so much for having me, man. I'm really excited to have done this with you. I've been watching your videos forever, and it's really, truly an honor, and I hopefully we can do this one day in person. I'll see you in Florida at the next show.